Good evening. Let's um thank you for that, Bruce. I've been told to speak more slowly and uh, that's the first. So how y'all doing? <laughs> Let's pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, you are the Father's eternal and beloved and faithful Son, Hamoshastopatri, of the same being as the Father. You are the one anointed in the Holy Spirit without measure. You are the one who has laid hold of the entire human race and taken us down in your death and lifted us up in your resurrection and lifted us into your Father's arms and into the world of the Holy Spirit in your ascension. We believe in you. With the praise of our whole hearts, we receive you and we ask you to send your Spirit to us in new and fresh ways tonight. And Holy Spirit, we give you permission to work behind the watchful dragons that we have put in place to protect ourselves. And we want you, and we ask you, Holy Spirit, to reveal Jesus not simply to us, but in us. That we can meet Him. Not doctrine, not theology, not Bible, but Jesus. That we can encounter Him in our innermost beings. And that Jesus would lead us to see the Father with His own eyes, and know the Father's heart as Jesus does. And then we can rest. And we ask in the name of Jesus, Amen. They told me to put it closer to my mouth. So, is that better? It was making a bunch of noise, wasn't it? I grew up in South Mississippi, which is one of the southern states in the United States, and I grew up in a town of about a thousand people. We had, when in the heyday of our little town of Prentice, there were four red lights. Now there are two. And I grew up in the Southern Presbyterian tradition. I memorized the child's catechism when I was a little, a little boy. I had, when I graduated from high school, a 13-year perfect Sunday school attendance pen. We went to church on our holidays in order that I could get that 13-year pen. There's never been a time in my entire life that I cannot remember or that I can remember when I didn't believe that Jesus was our Savior. There was also never a time. Pardon. May I help you? Sure. You scared me there. (laughs) I, I hadn't said anything to get in trouble yet. Oh, man. Uh, there was also never a time when I didn't know that something was wrong. Like I said last night, I think, or in some conversation, my mother, if she was here, she will tell you that I was born wrestling with this whole church, Christian, Christian life, what's going on. And there's one moment in my, in my childhood that I remember that really, when I look back, I see that this was one of those moments where the Lord was really bothering me. There's a burr under my saddle. Our family sat on the third pew from the front, on the right from the pastor's side, because my great-grandfather founded the church, and that's where he sat. And they still, our family still sits there. <laughs> um, and we would go, and we would sit, my two brothers, and then later on my sister and my mother, and we would sit in the third pew waiting for my father. My dad and all his buddies were outside, and you could hear them. And they were out there in those days having their last cigarette before they came inside. My, my, grand, I mean my aunt, Polly, played the organ. And she would, there was a certain key and a certain volume, and when she hit it, the men knew <laughs> it's time to come in. 
And I would look back and watch for my dad and Tut Williams, who was my best friend's uh, dad, who, who had the most distinctive laugh, the most beautiful laugh. You heard it, she just made you want to smile and you would laugh. And they would be out there telling jokes and talking about football and crawfish boils and whatever. And I could hear them. And I remember sitting there with my mother trying to get serious about worshiping God. I didn't know what that meant. Nobody ever explained to me. I just knew we were supposed to be serious. I remember one time my dad, we were having communion. And I was sitting next to my dad and, and, he, and he does like this. And he's, you know, I said, Dad, what are you doing? He says, I'm getting in earnest. <laughs> I said, Dad, who's Ernest? <laughs> I never could figure it out, you know. We'd have communion and everybody would do like this. And so I'm like, okay, what, <laughs> what's in this grape juice? Thing? I really, it really bothered me. I could never get any answers to questions like, what, what's going on here? What is communion about? Anyway, I could hear my dad and Tut Williams and the men out there, and Aunt Polly hit, hit the key, and my dad and Tut Williams and all those men came across that threshold, and I remember it vividly. When they, they stopped laughing, they got on their Presbyterian uh, faces, and they came and they sat down, and we worshiped God. That's what we did. And then as soon as it was, it was over, we went back and crossed the threshold again, and we all went back to being who we were. I mean, it was very I mean, obvious to a little boy. Because I, Saturday night at our house, we had a crawfish boil, or we were cooking something, and all these men were over there then. And it was this event of crossing the threshold that changed to grown men. They morphed into something that they weren't. And I never could understand it, and it bothered me. And, and so I look back now at my life, and I realize that the Lord had been calling me from early on to wrestle with these questions. I don't see myself even today as being a preacher or a teacher or a minister. I'm the dude that's got four million questions. What I didn't see and understand is that there are people all over the world that have the same questions. So I just have dug and wrestled and wrestled to try to understand what's going on. And when I went to college at the University of Mississippi, which is one of the most beautiful, in fact, it was voted the most beautiful campus in the United States. We were known in those days as a great party school. I didn't even know we had a library until my senior year. <laughs> just saying. We had a large time. And, uh, and at the end of these parties, when I was in college, at one or two in the morning, I would walk in this field behind the dormitory. And I was praying. And I was saying, Lord, there has to be more. There has to be more. I mean, I had memorized the catechism. I knew scripture backwards and forwards. I had 13-year perfect Sunday school attendance pen. And I just knew there had to be more to this. I just knew it, but I could not for the life of me get a handle on this. In my junior year, this girl that I was dating, we broke up, and I went out to talk to my, my fraternity big brother, and he said, it was right at the end of the, uh, uh, May, which is the beginning of our summer, and he said, why don't you come to North Carolina with me and work at a boys' camp called Camp Rockmont? I said, well, sounds good to me. Did they pay? And he said, yeah, yeah. And he, so he had been going for about 10 years. And so he, got, he called and got me a job. And the next thing I know, we're headed to North Carolina. And the next thing I know, I'm in the cabin with, with 10, 13-year-old boys. That was, that was the job nobody wanted. <laughs> so they gave it to me. My first night off, you know, you, you know what short sheeting is? Yeah. Okay. Well, m when my first night out, I came back to the cabin and uh, my first day off, and I came back, and I thought, well, they, you know, they're going to short sheet my bed, you know. So I was ready for it. And I walked in, and they had dismantled my bed and put it on the roof. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I got the job, because nobody wanted the 13-year-olds. And I had to have devotionals for them every morning. And since I knew the Bible backwards and forwards, it was easy to do the devotionals. You know, I knew what, to, I knew what passages to go to, whatever. And, and then one morning, uh, over the loudspeaker system, they said, today, instead of having uh, individual devotions in each cabin, we're going to have a group devotion in the, um, in the main gymnasium. 
So having the 13-year-old boys, they were the last ones to get there. And of course, that meant the only space was right here, front row. So I'm sitting about where Mark is sitting, and in walks Billy Graham. Our camp was happened to be two miles from Billy Graham's house. He walks in, and it was like Moses. <laughs> I'm like, whoa. <laughs> I mean, I had always had great respect for him, but he was Baptist, you know. <laughs> I was Presbyterian. You know, it's like in the, the movie River Runs Through It, the Baptists were the Methodists who could read. <laughs> That's just a joke. But I, I mean, I was like, you know, I didn't expect... As a Presbyterian, you sort of stick to your world. You know, you read Presbyterian books. You, do, you don't venture out. Anyway, Billy Graham walked in. And I don't remember his whole sermon, but I remember one point in particular. And I don't know that he was looking at me. Because a lot of times when you speak and you're trying to gather your thoughts, you end up looking at somebody and you don't necessarily mean it. But they certainly feel it. <laughs> it reminds me of a time. <laughs> I was leading a prayer in the church. My children were on the third row, and they were little. And I was leading the prayer, and I said, let us pray. And as I did, I, I mouthed the words to my children. My son in particular said, straighten up. Then nobody came. And so this lady on the front row, she goes. <laughs> I kid you not. <laughs> And she was a visitor. It was like Easter, you know. <laughs> and I sat there thinking, I've got, so I made a beeline for the door, hoping I would see her. She went out the side door. <laughs> I've never, I tell that story all the time, hoping one day I'll meet her. You know, just like, <laughs> you could just see her the whole time. What does he know? What's he, what's he saying? <laughs> anyway, where was I? <laughs> Billy Graham. So Billy Graham comes in, and I had been wrestling my whole life trying to understand how this works, uh, what was the real meaning of this, how does it actually touch your heart. I love that song, that, you know, about be still, and you don't have to push in. I mean, that's all true. But the question, I mean, who doesn't want to be still? The question is why we can't. You know, that's the question. I mean, Jesus promises the river of living water. Well, where is it? You know, I'm not making an accusation. I'm just simply saying that's what he promises to me. So I'm wrestling with this. Where is this river of living water? And there was another part of me that said, if this river of living water or the kingdom of God is the same thing as this particular, you know, form of religion that I knew, then I really don't, I don't really want that. You know, if I'm going to be honest. And anyway, Billy Graham stands up and he looks right at me when he's gathering his thoughts and he says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And I mean, it was like one of those, whoosh, you know, I felt like, and I thought, man. And now look back 30 years, 30, 34 years, I look back and I see that the Lord had had me wrestling my life, early life, with trying to understand. I come to this point. Billy Graham says, you shall know the truth and the truth sets you free. Now I look back and I realize for the last 34 years, I've been trying to understand what is the truth. And how does it actually set you free? And that verse has become sort of central to me in terms of my own personal uh, struggles and my own personal growth. So... When I look at that, and I ask the question, what is the truth? Jesus says, if you continue in my word, you will be my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Now, when he says, if you continue in my word, he's not talking about the New Testament. He's not talking about the Bible. But that was sort of a shock for me when I realized that. Hang on, he said this when there wasn't a New Testament. What's he talking about? And then one day, and I, I've come back to this uh, in the last several months to see this all over again. Uh, you know how Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I always thought that meant the Bible. So Jesus dealt, dealt with evil by quoting scripture. So that's what you do is you memorize scripture and quote it back. And then one day I was looking in the Greek de New Testament and I discovered that the word there for word is not graphe, which is writings or, or scripture. The word there for word is what? Who knows? 
It's Rhema. And I thought, my goodness. Rhema. When John says, in the beginning was the Word, he uses Logos. Jesus is the living Logos. And when the living Logos, Jesus himself speaks to us, and we hear him, that is not graphe writings, that is rhema. And that's what we live from. Man shall not have life by bread alone, but by every word, by every rhema that proceeds from the mouth of God. This was a revelation to me. And so I'm looking at this and I think, okay, so... And as that person walks in this rhema, as we hear Jesus and take these steps with him, as I said last night, with um, um, when he comes to us and he, and he challenges, the Holy Spirit reveals to us something, and he's asking us to take sides with him against the way we see things. That's the same sort of idea as when Jesus says, when you hear me speak, it's not going to be something you know. It's going to be news. And good news. And as you walk with me, as you allow me to disciple you, you're going to come to know the truth. And the truth is going to set you free. One part of this is, we don't set ourselves free. We cannot set ourselves free. That's like telling the blind man to go give himself sight. It, Jesus is saying that the truth is what sets us free. It has the power to do something inside of us. It's the truth that has the power to calm us down and to give us peace and to give us that which we don't know. Now, that alone seems to me to be a scandal to most of what I see that passes as Christianity in our modern world. Most of what I see happening is our own effort and determination to figure out how to set ourselves free. And Jesus is saying, when you hear me and you walk with me, you're going to begin gradually to know the truth. And the truth, when you come to know it, has the power to calm your inner world right down and set you free from yourself, set you free from this G.O.D. and all this entangled mess and all of this effort and all of this work and all of this, what the songs say, pressing in and um, trying to... to um, Give ourselves a wholeness that we cannot possibly have without Jesus. So the prayer there for me is, Holy Spirit, do for me what only you can do. That, you know what I mean by when I talk about us trying to accomplish this on our own? Uh, here's an illustration. The Lord gives us a vision. And then what we do is we set out... And we get groups together, we pray, and then we figure out how to go accomplish the vision, and we go and do it. You with me? I don't think the Lord gives us a vision in order for us to go do it. I think He gives us the vision to let us know that He's in here and He's doing it. And we can rest and ask Him, how do we participate? Because I can guarantee you what He's going to do with this is going to be way bigger than what we can accomplish in our own strength. And we get over here in this mess, and we accomplish this in our own strength. Then we have to label this the kingdom or the church or the glory of God. And then we have to convince everybody that this is really it. And you got a little boy sitting in the pew smelling the rat. And this little boy is just hard-headed enough to think, I'm not, I'm not drinking the Kool-Aid. I don't know where we're going here, but this, this is not it. This is not the river. This is not the kingdom. That doesn't mean it's... It's completely absent. I don't mean that. There's life everywhere. The Holy Spirit is able, to, as we keep saying, is a redeeming genius and can be involved in everything. And you'll see this um, maybe even tonight as we work through um, what is the truth. So Jesus is talking about us coming to know something that when we know it, it has the power to do something for us that we cannot do. There's not a recipe that we can concoct that will calm our inner worlds like that. And you know what happens when your inner world is calm? The, I use the phrase unearthly assurance. That when your soul is baptized with unearthly assurance, you know what, you, what happens? You begin to notice other people. You begin to notice that your daughter's sad. You begin to notice that you really hadn't been there for your wife. You begin to notice that uh, there are people around you that, that, that have things that they need.
But when your inner world is not at peace and that, that assurance is not there, then you're caught up in all this striving and you're trying to make this happen. You don't see what's going on around you. And you don't see the glory of the Father, Son, and Spirit's life that is staring us all in the face all the time. We can't see it. So the more, more turmoil there is inside of you, the less you see. And the less you see, the less you're free to relate and give yourself. In fact, the more turmoil there is inside of you, the more self-centered you become. That's the way it works. As your soul is in turmoil, then your wife is there, and you may or may not know this, but your wife is there to try to fix that for you. And you're trying to manipulate her to get her to do that. That's not relationship. That's manipulation. That's just sort of a side point about the, the inner world. But Jesus is saying, I can calm that storm. And I know how to do it. And he's saying, and, I, and you walk with me and you listen to me, you hear me, you're going to begin to know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Two words right there before we look at the truth. The word know and the word free. In the Bible, some, sometimes the criticism that is leveled towards me and Paul and some of our uh, brothers is Baxter saying that everyone is saved, they just don't know it. That's leveled as a criticism. It's the truth. That person that says that doesn't understand what the word no means in the Bible. The first instance of the word no in the Bible is when Adam knew Eve. That's not information. That's face-to-face -face union. That's back to in the beginning was the Word and the Word was turned toward the Father. Face-to-face. -face. That's communion of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is not talking about memorizing a few Bible verses or reciting a few things in Sunday school and church. He's talking about a knowing that goes down into the very depth of our being. It involves a face-to-faceness and a relationship, which in fact involves then a, a fellowship and a, and a oneness. The word perichoresis means, or if you say it in Greek, perichoresis. <laughs> perichoresis means mutual indwelling, without loss of personhood. Jesus and the Father are face to face in the Spirit and they dwell in one another so profoundly um, that they are one, yet they do not lose themselves. And as we come to know the truth, it begins to set us free. We notice, we see, we begin to have fellowship, and in that fellowship we begin to have that perichoresis, that mutual indwelling, which is what all of us desire but if you're like me, I keep getting tripped up in losing myself in the process or in demanding that people around me do the things that I want them to do. And that's manipulation again. So when Jesus says that you will know the truth, he's talking about a profound mutual indwelling, a communion that is not intellectual. It involves your mind, but it is more of an experience. And it's more of a union and communion. And he says, when you, when, as you come to know this, not simply in your head, but down in the corridors of your soul, down in your darkness, down in your sin, then it begins to set you free and that, that communion begins to take shape and you don't even know it's happening. Now, like I said last night, a little story about the boy and my son in, in the den. You remember the story? Religion jumps up and starts looking at how to have an, a relationship like this. And that's what happens a lot. We start trying to have, a, to have a knowledge like what Jesus is talking about. And we can define it. And us PhD types can spend a whole lot of years defining it. And doing steps and all this sort of thing. But that's, he's bringing us back to communion. He's saying, you continue to, to take these steps with me and listen to me. And walk with me and hear me, you're going to begin to know the truth. You're going to begin to know it here. And it's going to begin to set you free. And you're going to be, begin to be Baxter. You're not only going to know there's something wrong. You're not only going to know that this is a mess. You're not only going to know you're going to begin to be able to stand up and look at this and say, no, I'm going to find the answer here. And then as the heat comes, 
as the condemnation comes, as the shame comes, as the criticism comes, you stand right there because you know something. You know someone. And this is the beginning of freedom from all of this. We don't just get baptized, as it were, and suddenly we move from there back over into this beautiful circle that we were talking about last night. It takes those steps. Now the question for me all these years has been what then is the truth? What is the truth? What is this truth that has the power and the authority, the exousia, to enter into me at that deep, deep and profound level and begin to go to work and do for me what I could never do in a million years on my own? What is the truth? Now the easy answer to that is the truth is a person. It's not an abstract idea or a theology or a doctrine. It is a person. And that person is Jesus. And you read John's Gospel, it sort of builds. And so you have Jesus saying this in John chapter 8, verse 31, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. So John's got you asking, well, what's the truth? What is the truth? What is the truth? And the whole Gospel of John funnels from chapter 1 all the way down to this upper room. That's the whole point of the first 12 chapters of John's Gospel, is to bring you where you can sit in the upper room and you can hear this conversation. And so Jesus is talking to the disciples in the upper room. They don't know what is going on, but they feel sad. They are distraught. They know that this is not going to turn out the way they had hoped. They don't understand what Jesus is talking about. They don't understand what's going on. They feel sad. They feel like something bad is going to happen, and they can't control it, and they have no, they're powerless. And so Jesus comforts them. And he says to them, I, the, I am promising to send to you the Father is going to send to you in my name another comforter, another soul mate. Not another mind mate. Another soul mate. And that's going to be the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus makes this promise to them that I just love. My dad is, um, he's suffering from Alzheimer's. And um, he's doing well, but he's, he's, he's really aware of the fact that he's not able to, you know, get his mind like he was a, he was a, a lawyer and a judge and a general in the National Guard, so he's used to being an in-charge kind of guy. Um, so he was really wrestling with this, and, and so I wrote down for him, I said, Dad, I got a Bible verse that I want your job every day is to memorize this verse every day. And I wrote it on a post-it note. I stuck it on his mirror in his bathroom, and here's the verse. I will not leave you orphaned. I will not leave you orphaned. I will come to you. Now that's the verse that, I was, that, that precedes. You see, Jesus is comforting his disciples. He's saying, all right, I'm sending another comforter. And believe me, this comforter knows how to comfort. And not only that, but I will not leave you orphaned. And there are many times in your life when you realize that whatever it is, wherever it is you think you need to be, you cannot get there. And Jesus is promising, I will not leave you orphaned. I don't do, this circle doesn't do abandonment. Jesus says to his disciples, I will not leave you orphaned. Believe me. And then he says, he's talking about uh, the Holy Spirit. He says, in that day, John 14, 20. In that day, when the Holy Spirit comes and when I don't leave you orphaned, in that day you will know. Anybody know the verse? This is fascinating. Pardon? Come on. Come on. Think about this. If you, to me, if you, had, if, you, if you took the entire Bible and you squeezed it together and one verse dropped out, here it is. John 14, 20. In that day, Jesus says, the day of the Spirit... The day when you hear me, when I don't leave you orphaned. He's talking about it in the resurrection and Pentecost. He says, in that day you will know that I am in my Father. And you are in me. And I am in you. 
Now, if we need a verse that helps us see something of who Jesus is as the truth, this is it. And in this verse, we're told three things. And it's so simple. And I wonder how many of you have ever even noticed the verse. That's not a criticism. Most of us have not even noticed that verse because we've been caught for most of our lives in this. And when you're here, you don't notice verses like, I am in you and you're in me. You notice verses about what we're supposed to do. Right? I, can, I, I am so thrilled that, th that this verse is in the New Testament and it's in the red letter part. No, we would have never figured this out in a million years. The first thing Jesus says, when, you, when the Holy Spirit comes, way before we get power, Way before we talk about the dunamis, the power of the Holy Spirit, he says, when the Holy Spirit comes, you're going to discover something as being true that you did not know. And the first thing you're going to discover, and the first part of the truth that sets you and me free in the human race is, it's got nothing to do with you. I just love this. It's got nothing to do with me. The first thing I see is not me at all, but what? Jesus is going to say, you're going to discover in the Spirit, not simply here, but in here, it's going to dawn on you that I am the one who's face to face with the Father. In fact, Jesus doesn't even say that I'm the one who's with the Father, does he? What word, what, what's the preposition? It's in. You're going to see that I am the one who has the relationship with the Father, and I have the relationship that is so true and right and beautiful and good that the only way to describe it is to say that I'm in the Father. And the Father's in me. The first thing that happens when the Holy Spirit turns the lights on is you don't even look at yourself at all. This is how this sets us free here. The first thing that happens, Baxter, when you begin to see is that you're no longer worried about this. You're no longer looking at the God who really has his back turned to you and figuring out how I can get it turned back and then how I can get it, this God to bless me. You're not thinking about it. The first thing you do is you're overwhelmed. Who was the first person in history to see this? Let me read something to you. S Stephen, the first martyr of the church. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the quick and they began gnashing their teeth. But being full of the Holy Spirit... In that day, when the Holy Spirit comes, but being full of the Holy Spirit, Stephen gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing at the Father's right hand, and he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Now that English translation says, I see Jesus standing at the right hand. The word is ek, E-K. It means standing out of. He sees Jesus, uh, Stephen sees Jesus standing out of the being of the Father. Ah! Come on. <laughs> now think about Stephen's emotional experience. He is being stoned to death. <laughs> He's not having a, a presbytery debate. <laughs> He's being killed. And he looks up and he sees exactly what Jesus said he was going to see. He sees Jesus standing out of the, very fa the Father's very being. And it moves him to such profound, in such a profound way that he actually says, like Jesus did, Father, forget them. When, when the Holy Spirit is at work, and I'm not, this is my litmus test. When people claim to be all these things happening in the Holy Spirit, I'm all for anything the Holy Spirit wants to do. But if it's not pointing us to Jesus and his relationship with the Father, I got some real questions. I got some real questions. I'm not chasing power and miraculous things and doing this. I want to know about that relationship. I want to know about this relationship between the Father and the Son. This is the most beautiful thing in the entire cosmos. 
And if you want to know the truth that sets you free, this is where the Holy Spirit directs us. This is what the Holy Spirit loves to do. Get our eyes off of ourselves and on to the other. This is the light of life. The Holy Spirit comes and begins to show us who Jesus really is. He's the one who's in the Father. I think that's the most wonderful news in the world. Unless, unless then, that all we're left with at that moment is what we might call the hooray for Jesus model of Christianity. Well, that's great, Jesus. I mean, you made it. What about us? How do we get there? How in the world am I ever going to be able to be in the Father? How is that ever going to happen? And what would heaven be if it was anything less than that relationship? I mean, just the building that was beautiful? I mean, you're talking about heaven. This is what heaven is. It's the relationship of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So Jesus knows that if we're not, that, that if we're not careful, we're going to hear this and we're going to turn around and go into the, the, the Eeyore. You know, woe is me. So Jesus says, look, this is the first thing you're going to see. And at every point in your Christian life, no matter where you are and when you are despairing and when you're struggling and when you, you cannot find your way, you go back here to Jesus' relation with the Father. I am the one who's face to face with the Father. I am the one who knows the Father. I am the one who uh, dwells in the Father and the Father dwells in me. I have the relationship. Not you. I know the Father. Not you. He has to clear it away. He has to say to Saul of Tarsus, you don't know what you're talking about, Saul. I'm the one that knows the Father. And then you're ready to begin to see the rest of what Jesus is trying to tell us. You're going to see that I am the one who's in the Father and the Father's in me. We are the one who, who are, um, I am the one who's anointed in the freedom and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And then what does he say? And I want you to read this. This is in the Bible. I'm not making this up. Once you see that Jesus is in the Father, you see something else. What is it? I am in the Father and you are in me. You are in me. Father, I desire that the ones that you gave to me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. First thing we see, this is the key to our own renewal. It's the key to, our, to the future of the Christian church. Every single time we come back to see that Jesus is the one who has a relation with the Father, and then it begins to dawn on us that he has included us. He did it. And we're sitting over here trying to figure out how we're going to get in. And some buffoon is telling us, this is the way, this is the way, this is the way. And we don't know who we are, so we go, okay, okay, okay. And we wonder why we're bored, and we wonder why 12-year-old little boys look around and say, this is crap. You see this? I mean, come on, he's telling you he's in the Father, and he has you with him. You're not outside. You're not lost. Come on. Come on. You're not outside. The entire tradition starts the presentation of the gospel is that you're separated from God. Jesus is saying, you're going to see that I'm in the Father and you're in me. Where did that crap come from? That's killing us. It's absolutely killing us. And people hear this and they look at me like a cow staring at a new gate. <laughs> I mean, who's crazy here? This is what Jesus said. It's in the gospel. It's in the red letter. It's right at the heart of the gospel of John's move towards the upper room. Did you see? Jesus is saying, you're in me. And he's saying, I did this. You didn't do this. You didn't make this happen. I did this. This is my grace. This is my grace. I did this. This is who I am. Don't underestimate me. See me in my glory. See who I am. I pray to my Father that you would know who I am. And that you would see me as I am. Behold my glory. Know that I'm the one who is in the Father. And the one who's gathered the human race together in me. That's what he wants us to see. That's when you can rest. Until then, it's not rest. 
It's just one more form of religion and striving, and it's, it's designed to help you get someplace that you already are. There is no rest until you see that you're in Jesus and He's in the Father. Let me read a, a part of a prayer to you. Listen to this. With great joy, with the praise of my whole heart, I acknowledge and agree, Jesus, that you have found me in my darkness and sin. You have laid hold of me and taken me down in your death, freed me from sin and evil, quickened me with new life in your resurrection, and lifted me up into your Father's arms in your ascension. Listen. All of me and mine... Every war-torn fragment, every fearful, unbelieving, shame-riddled, broken part is in you, in your Father, in the Holy Spirit. What I am telling you, what Jesus Christ is telling you, is that He laid hold of you as a sinner, and He has you in Him, in the Father. You want to be delivered from this? You know why we can't be delivered from this? Because on this model, God cannot even look at sin. And so we can't even begin to contemplate the fact that Jesus became sin. He has laid hold of you at your worst. You can go home tonight or go to your room tonight and write down the ten things that you're most ashamed of. I'm serious. You write them down. And then you look at Jesus and you say, Lord Jesus, I agree that this very part of me is in you, in the Father. I agree that this part of me is in you, in the Father. I agree that this part of me is, that I'm ashamed of is in you, in the Father. And there it is being resolved. You with me? I can assure you, when we meet Jesus face to face, we are not going to say to him, Jesus, I overestimated you. We're not. We're going to say, oh my goodness. What was I thinking? It was in the red letter part. I read it a hundred times. He told me that He was in the Father and that I was in Him. He said, believe this. This is what you believe. This is what you focus on. We've turned in this whole framework of separation, it is strange. It really is strange because when you start off with you're separated from God, then the only way you can get back if you're in the Protestant tradition is by faith. You with me? But faith in what? What are, you, what are you being told to believe there? That you can get back if you believe you can get back? It's so bizarre because in the end what you believe in is in the power of your faith. You with me? What are we being told to believe in when the first word is separation? You're separated from God but you can get back if you believe. Believe this is me. I'm 12 years old. Believe what? Just tell me what to believe. Believe that I can get be saved if I believe that I can get saved. I mean, it just it's pretzel logic, and it doesn't do anything to your insides except make it worse. I'm telling you what to believe. What you are to believe is Jesus is in the Father and you're in Him. That's what you believe. That's it. That's what you believe. That's the truth that begins to set you free. That and that alone has the power to speak to your brokenness. The power to speak to your, to your inner world. That and that alone has the power to speak to your sin. To your guilt. To your shame. Jesus says, I know your guilt. I know your shame. I've got it with me in the Father. Let it go. Now we will take some time tomorrow or the next day somewhere here to look into how Jesus pulled this off because that's really important. How did he get me in his father in him? I want to know the, I want to know about that. And lo and behold when you ask that question the New Testament is screaming it to us. But we can't really notice it when we're caught up in this. But let me tell a couple of stories. I have wrestled with this my whole life. And when I was in Scotland studying, the reason I went to Scotland to study with Professor James Torrance is because I knew he knew what this was about. I had read Athanasius and I had read T.F. Torrance and those two brothers knew 
what we're talking about here. And J.B. Torrance understood. And I thought, if I can go study with him, he can at least help me break out of this mess. And I did. And he did help me again and again and again. And I was in Scotland, but I was still processing on how in the world can this be? I'm reading it. I'm reading it in the early church, but it's just blowing my mind here because it's all gnarled and separated and the box of loose coat hangers is getting worse. And it's just like, and so my brother comes over to play golf and we're in Scotland and I'm sitting in the Aberdeen airport waiting for my older brother to come and I'm reading the newspaper and I look up and there's a young man probably in his early 30s or so, late 30s, and he's looking at the arrivals monitor and then looking out the window. And there's all kind of people around. But you know, sometimes you just happen to notice certain people. And I just happen to notice this man. And he would look at his watch and look at the arrivals monitor and look out the window. And I figured, being a genius, that he was waiting on somebody. Uh, anyway, sure enough, before long, a, a, a plane taxied up to the little jet tube and, and the doors opened. Let's say the, the double doors there opened and people started coming through the doors going every which way like you do in the airport. Some people you knew were home. You could see it on their faces. Some people were like, we're late. We've got to figure out where the next flight is. Some people didn't know where, which way to go. They were looking for the baggage claim. And that man walked over and he stood about right here to those doors looking. And eventually there, were, there was no one else there. And he looked at his watch, he looked back at the monitor, and he was trying to figure out what was going on. And then all of a sudden, a little boy, about 11 years old, came and stood in the double doors. And he scanned the, the crowd like an alarmed deer. And then I heard his father say something. I think it was probably his son's name. I didn't hear it. But I'm sitting over here looking at this. And then this little boy comes flying across that airport, drops his bag, and in one movement drops his bag and flies through the air and hits his dad. And they, and they kiss each other and there's tears. And I'm sitting there just thinking, man, no parent or grandparent could have seen that without tears. And right in the middle of that, and I was still Presbyterian at the time, I heard, I heard a rhema word. I'm a Presbyterian in recovery now. And here, here is what I heard. Baxter, that is the gospel. That little boy is Jesus coming home from the far country. There's the resurrection. There's the ascension. There's the embrace. And he said, Baxter, the good news is he has you and the whole world with him. And I'm sitting there and I know this thing is true. This is the truth. And I'm going, no. <laughs> it's, just not, it's too simple. Uh, don't I have to do something? So I tell that story everywhere I go. I tell, I've been to Australia probably 15 or 20 times. I tell it there every time I go. Everywhere I go, I tell that story. It's so beautiful and so simple to me. It has such a magnificent vision of Jesus and his relation with the Father and of John 14, 20. And the first time I told it in Australia, I sat, at the end I sat down on the front row and I heard this young lady coming down uh, the aisle and she was crying and she said Mr. Kruger Mr. Kruger her name was Stephanie and I thought uh, surely I, I must have said something that, that may be funny in America but doesn't work in Australia and I heard her feelings uh, and she came and she sat beside me and I put my arm around her and I said Stephanie what is wrong what is wrong and she said, nothing is wrong, Mr. Kruger. Big old tears coming. And she, I said, nothing is wrong, Mr. Kruger. And I said, well, why are you crying? And she said, well, when you told the story of the little boy in the, in the airport, the Lord gave me a vision. And I said, well, what was your vision? She said, I saw God on a throne, high and lifted up. And there were these steps going up to the throne. And there were all these people on the steps trying to get to God, and none of us could do it. 
and our fingers, nails were bloody, our elbows were bloody, we were exhausted and we were sad and we were crying and none of us could get to God. And I was thinking, you know, we can't get there. And I said, well, Stephanie, did you see anything else? And she said, yeah, I saw Jesus. And I said, well, what did Jesus, what did Jesus do? And she said, he came over, gathered all of us together, walked up the steps and sat down in his father's lap. <laughs> We're going to see this. Either today or in the next life. The whole world is going to come to see the real truth in Jesus. You know why? Because it's true and the Holy Spirit is on it. The Holy Spirit cannot bear for us to be in Jesus, in the Father, and not know it. And live like church mice in fear and hiding and, and beholden to every tr crafty wind of doctrine that comes along. The Holy Spirit is passionate that we know who we are in Jesus and then live from that freedom. That's the hope here. The Holy Spirit will not let it go. It will never let it go. I, when I heard Stephanie, I told her, when she told me her story, I said, Stephanie, that is the gospel. Jesus grabbed hold of me, old, broken, sinful, war-torn, fragmented, unbelieving Baxter laid hold of me and used my sin as his way of laying hold of me, walked up the steps, sat down in the Father's lap, and Jesus is saying to all of us right now, you are free to live in your own world if you want to. But this is the real world. This is the real world. And this is the truth that has the power to set you free at the deepest places in your being. When you see that you and all of you are included in this. And Jesus did it. And we haven't even voted yet. That doesn't make any sense. What about faith? What about repentance? What about what, what, Wait a minute. This is the truth. Jesus is saying, now you vote. You're voting now. Even right now, you're, now when you see who we are in Jesus, in the Father, now is when He says, now what are you going to believe? What's your vote now? What's the point of voting over here because we don't even have anything to vote on? Here Jesus says, now you can vote. Now tell me. Now believe. This is the one thing I ask you to do is to believe. How strange is it for us to be in Jesus, in the Father, and not believe it? And we live in fear when we are embraced. And we're seated in Him above all rule and authority. In fact, what Jesus has done, He has included us in His own unique relationship with the Father. He has included us in His own unique anointing in the Holy Spirit. And He's included us in His own Lordship over all creation, above all rule and authority, and every name that is named, both in this age and the age to come. That's who we are. That's who we are. Include, that's our identity included in this Jesus in at least those threefold ways. Are you with me? I don't care if this is frying your brain. Better to be fried tonight than later. <laughs> I, I'm, you know what I mean. I understand what this does to our heads. Believe me, I understand it. I have turned over every leaf in that whole gnarled mess. And this is the most beautiful reality in all the creation. The Apostle Paul says, Since then you have been raised up with Christ and seated with Him at the right hand of the Father. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things of the earth, whether it's religion or materialism, whatever. Focus here. For you have died and your life is hidden when Christ in God. And when Christ is revealed, when Christ who is our life is revealed, we too will be revealed with Him in glory. <laughs> when I said the other night that we live in a culture of unbelief, you can begin to see what I'm saying. It is difficult to stand up and talk about this, Jesus, because people look at you like you got a third eye. 
You know, because where we are is if I've never heard it, it can't be true. If I didn't hear it in my church, it can't be the truth. So this is where there's a, a wonderful, liberating crisis brewing in us. And we haven't even finished the gospel yet. As beautiful as it is to see that it's not about you, but it's about Jesus' relation with His Father and about the fact that He has included you and me and the human race in it. I'm in the Father, you're in me. There's a third thing He says. What's the third thing? I'm in you. Now that is really difficult to understand when you've grown up in a separation model that is external and your whole life you've been told to be good and do it this way and try harder and pray more and give more. Jesus is saying you're going to see that I'm the one in the Father and I've got you with me and it's so real and it is so true and I have done such a thoroughly wonderful job of including you in me that I'm already in you. And you know what you call that? That is the light of life. All of a sudden you begin to think, wait a minute, Jesus, what does this mean? What does this mean? What it means is back to the story of my son and his buddy in the den. What it means is there is a love at work in you. Father, I desire that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. There is a love at work in you that you didn't know about. In fact, you know about it, but you didn't know what to call it. Because when you start off with a separation model, here, God's, we're separated from God, then I'm just human. You with me? So the love that I have for my son and my daughter is just human. Because I'm separated from God. All these people that we know around New Zealand that make no profession of faith or whatever, the ones that love their daughters and their husbands and their, their wives, that love therefore must be just human. And what Jesus is saying is when the light goes on, you're going to realize there is no human love. There's only one circle of love in the universe, and that's the Father, Son, and Spirit. You want to know what your motherhood is about? Now you know. You're included in Jesus, and, his, and He is not only up there watching you from a distance, He's already in you, and He's already sharing the love that the Father loves with Him, and it's already coming to expression in you, and we call it motherhood, and fatherhood, and sacrifice. This is the origin of our music. I mean, there is no harmony in evil. This is the origin of our passion. This is the origin of our creativity. This is the origin of everything that we think is just human. This is why this is all so close we cannot dare to see it. We've been trapped in this darkness. Let me give you a couple of stories and then we'll stop in Paul. I'll ask you to come up and we can do some um, um, Q&R. This lady uh, came into my office one day and she had a stack of newsletters that thick. It was around Christmas time. And a stack of newsletters from people from all over the world. And she walked into my office and she slammed them on my desk and she said, I feel like a pile of crap. And I said, what? what, 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 what what's going on? She said, I've been reading these newsletters. And there are all these people out there doing all these wonderful things for God. And she said, even their children are perfect. <laughs> and she said, and she said, for Pete's sake, she says, I don't have anything to offer to God. She says, I, I do three loads of laundry a day. And when I'm not doing laundry, I'm grocery shopping. And when I'm not grocery shopping, I'm cooking the groceries. And when I'm not cooking the groceries, I'm cleaning up after cooking the groceries. And she said, somewhere in there, I'm trying to keep my house presentable and find a little bit of time for my hu husband. And by the end of the day, I'm too tired to even read my Bible. What do I have to offer God? That distant deity watched me from a distance. And that's what she asked me. What do I have to offer God? And it was one of those rare moments in my life where the answer came when it needed to come and not on the way home. <laughs> You know, when I was playing back the conversation. And I said to her, I said, I just, just the other day, you told me about your daughter and her coat. And she said, what's that got to do with anything? I said, well, did you, um, 
Did you just take a good mother pill that, that morning and rededicate yourself to motherhood and caring about your daughter and her coat? You told me you, she were trying to find her a new winter coat and you wanted one that she could wear this year and next year, but not look like it this year. And one that was on sale. And I remember you came by and to tell me that you found it. You were so excited. You found exactly the coat. So did you just wake up and dedicate yourself to motherhood? Or could it be that there's really only one good shepherd in this universe who cares for his sheep? And could it be that he doesn't do this shepherd, this family doesn't do anything alone? And could it be that this good shepherd put his burden for his sheep in your heart and you've been shopping in it all day long and you loved it? You gave everything you had to do it and you did it? But because you don't know who you are and what's really going on and you're trapped in this, you're, you're dying. And these newsletters are making you feel less than. What could be more wonderful than to be a mother in a thousand millennia your children are going to call you mama? Through your bodies has come something, has children come into being that are once here will never ever die ever. And in our culture, we treat that like it's just no big deal. The same for fatherhood. The same for music, the same for, for our passions. I was in the Midwest United States in, uh, I think, around Iowa. Somebody was talking about being in Iowa, somewhere up that way, because it's flat like this. It's totally flat. And this young man picked me up. I was speaking at a college, and he picked me up. And so we're driving down through all these farms all down through uh, this part of the country. And so he's talking about, you know, I'm asking what he's going to do. He's a senior, he's graduating. And he said he's going to go to seminary. And I said, so what are you going to be, a, a missionary? Are you going to be a pastor? What are you going to be? He says, I'm going to be a pastor. And right when I said that, this huge John Deere tractor made this turn right in front of us, and he was plowing the field. And he went back, and I said to this, little, this young man, I said, so you're going to be a pastor? I said, so how does Jesus relate to that man on that tractor. He said, what do you mean? I said, that man spends 60, 70, 80 hours a week farming. More than likely, his wife and his children are involved in this whole enterprise with him. More than likely, you're going to be pastor to farmers. So isn't it an important question to know how Jesus relates to what they do with their entire humanity? He said, well, yeah, but I don't know what you're talking about and what that means. And I said, I said, you do. And he said, I'm not following. I said, well, when you get home tonight and you get ready to eat supper, what are you going to do right before you eat supper? And he says, well, I'm going to pray. I said, what are you going to pray about? He says, I'm going to thank God for the food. I said, why are you thanking God for food that the farmer grew? And he said, well, are you telling me not to thank the Lord? I'm saying, no, you already know who that farmer is. That's why you're thanking God for food that he participated in growing. But you don't have a theology that will allow you to see what your heart already knows. And more than likely, you're going to end up treating him just like a farmer and not a doctor. Or not someone who has this in that position. When your own heart is telling you, when you kneel down and thank the Lord for the food that he grew, that that man is participating in the way the Father, Son, and Spirit are providing for the human race. That's the light of life. That's the dignity of our humanity. There is nothing ordinary about us. Nothing. This hierarchical mess that we have going in the church, you know, full-time, ordained, lay people. Are you kidding me? That's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, One died for all, therefore all died. Therefore I recognize no one according to the flesh. I don't recognize anyone according to their diploma or their income stream or their color or their race. I recognize people only in Jesus, in the Father, and Jesus in them. It changes the way you see human beings when you know that Jesus is already in them whether they believe it or not. It changes the way we relate to them. We don't walk over to them and say, look, brother, you're separated from God. Here's how to get back. I'm looking, thinking, how, what is Jesus doing in this man? What is he doing in this man? Just today, I had the, the privilege, Paul and I did, of going fishing with a brother in this room. And you should have seen the joy of Jesus Christ coming out of him on that boat. 
It's not funny. Let me just give you a little historical lesson here. The, the first or second commandment in the Bible, who knows what that is? Rule over the fish. I'm just saying, it's right there. <laughs> if you want to be a legalist, Jesus is resurrected. He is very soon to be ascended. And one of the last things he does on earth is what? He goes fishing. He catches fish. And one of the last things he says to his disciples is cast on the right side. We cannot cope with that. It's too human. And that is exactly the point. When Jesus shows up, he does things like make furniture. He does things like help people. He does things like pray for them. He does things like challenge the system. He's sharing, when he's sharing himself with us, that's the way it comes to expression is in our humanity. When we know that, we can begin to relate to people not in separation. We can begin to look for them for the light and, and the truth and the love of Jesus Christ coming to expression in them. That changes the way you hear music. You already know it. We already know it. We, we respond to it all the time. You just look at what gives someone life, what quickens them. And you better believe it's not just human. It's divine. It's Jesus in them. Now, I'll close with this one illustration. This is so, I can go on about this now in case you hadn't noticed. <laughs> when I was in college, back in the days when I was walking and praying, trying to figure out what this was all about, someone invited me to go to this conference retreat and some great preacher was going to be coming and I'm like well okay so I went along primarily because there were some really pretty girls that were going um, and so we're sitting there and this preacher gets up and he's he's man he's on it he's rolling and he says he says God is videotaping every thought that you have and everything that you have ever done and not done and he's recording it, every bit of it. And when you die and you stand before him, he's going to get this videotape out and he's going to plug it in and put it on the big screen in the, sun, in the, in the sky and even your grandmother's going to see it. Kid you not. I mean, there's not, a, there's not a kid in the room over 13 that's not thinking, oh man, how do I get an eraser? I mean, I mean you're talking about classic evangelical manipulation. I mean, everybody's coming forward. What do I have to do, Jesus? So over the years, I've thought about that. And I thought, well, when we die, it's not going to be a cassette player. It's going to be a DVD. <laughs> and Jesus is going to play it. He's going to, he's going to have a private screening with just him because this, this family's not into shame. And manipulation. So you have a private screening with Jesus, and he walks you into a room, and there's a big TV, and you put uh, the, the DVD titled, My Life in Contribution to the Kingdom of God, and you stick it in the DVD player, and you hit play, and you stand there like, okay. Blue screen comes up. Nothing. Hmm. Hang on here a minute. Play. Blue screen comes up, nothing. And I'm thinking, well, wait a minute. I went to New Zealand. I did funerals. I did baptisms. I, you, think, you start thinking about all the things that you think, I think, that I have done for the glory of a distant God. Does that not count for something, Jesus? I mean, come on. But it, nothing ever shows up. And about the time we get really frustrated about the injustice of this thing, Jesus taps us on the shoulder and he hands us another one. And this one's not titled My Life and Contribution to the Kingdom of God. This, is called, this one is titled Not You, But Christ in You. The Hope of Glory. And you stick this thing in and turn it on and it begins before you're born in eternity and comes forward to your conception and all of a sudden you begin to see, well, that's why I love fishing. That's why I care about my children. You begin to see how the life of the Trinity has been at work in you and in us all along. You with me? That's what Jesus is saying. In the day of the Holy Spirit, you're going to see I'm in the Father, you're in me, and I'm in you. And that changes everything.
It changes everything about the way we approach people and how we interpret what's going on in their lives and what's going on. It's the secret to fatherhood and motherhood. Not imposing our agenda upon our children, but actually seeing how Jesus is expressing himself and nurturing that. That's what the church is about, supposedly. So I'll stop there. The Seattle. Paul knows more of my stories than I do. Okay. The Se- oh yeah, yeah. This is another one of these. Um, I was going to the Northwest United States uh, flying. This was several years back, and I knew that I'd be flying over the Rocky Mountains. And at that point, I had never seen them, so I got a window seat. And I was all excited and got on the plane, and all 35 rows, the middle row uh, uh, was empty. Middle seat was empty on both sides of the plane. Everybody had space. So I was, this is going to be great. So I, the plane closes and it backs up, and then it stops and it goes forward and opens the door again. And this man comes on the plane. He looks like Indiana Jones. He's got a leather hat, a leather jacket. And he comes, starts walking back in the plane. And I kid you not, I'm thinking, I know exactly where he's going to sit. (laughs) I know exactly where he's going to sit. And he did. He walked all the way back there, past 30 rows of empty seats, and sat right beside me in the middle. And he introduced himself as a systematic microevolutionary biologist. He had come back, and I said, I'm just Baxter. uh." (laughs) He said... He said he had been on a research trip in the Caribbean and he had been researching plants and he was very concerned because we were losing whole species of plants to extinction and he pulls out this napkin and he starts writing these Latin names down of these plants that we had already lost of these plants that we were now losing and he was so burdened about this and he was so excited because he had a plan as to what we could do to keep from losing them and he was just all excited about this and so somewhere over Idaho he looks to me and he says he says well I know that you're a theologian and you probably want to talk to me about evolution and uh, I just said I don't care anything about evolution but I do have a question and he said what's your question I said, where did you get your passion for plants? And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, was Uncle Freddie a botanist? I mean, was your mother a botanist? Did a revival preacher come around preaching botany and you dedicate your... I mean, where, you're a grown man. You're writing Latin names down of species of plants that are extinct. I mean, you're fired up about this. I said, where did, the, where did this come from? And we looked at each other at the same time and says, well, I probably just evolved. And I said, oh, I think not. So I pull out my little napkin and I drew my three circles in there like this. And I said, I know, put Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I said, I know who you are. And I know your, the origin of your passion for plants. There's only one circle in this universe that cares about creation. And that fire in your belly is not yours. That belongs to Jesus. He's the one that cares about each and every one of these plants. He knows them by name. And Jesus is not the sort of person who likes to do things alone. So he put his passion for his plants in you. And you've been tooling around the Caribbean for two weeks, giving your entire life to it. You're fired up about it. And you don't even believe in God. And he like, you know, <laughs> I got three, four, five eyes now. You know, this is <laughs> and, he, <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, If that's true, why haven't I ever been told? And I said, you just were. You see, that's the gospel shining light, exposing us in our... our, uh, Actually, he's participating, but he's doing it. He thinks it's him. He thinks it has its origin in him. And he's very proud. And I'm saying, let me identify where this comes from. I've often thought about him... I looked him up. I found out who it was. I looked him up on the internet. He's still, he's gone on and done, and done great things. But I, I have this imaginary scenario in my head that he goes back, he lands, he's excited, so he goes to the Presbyterian church. 
or the Baptist church or maybe the Roman Catholic church. And so he says, hey, man, I want to, I, I, this is beautiful. I didn't know that my botany was in Jesus. Would you tell me about this? And oh, yeah, well, that's fine. Botany's good. But if you want to serve Jesus full time, you need to come over here and be involved in the life of the church and do this and this and this and this. So he says, well, okay. And so, you know, two, three years into doing all the things that he's supposed to do for God, he just finds himself dried up on the inside. He's not excited anymore. doesn't understand what's going on. He's in a crisis. I'm trying to do the Jesus thing, but, but I really do love botany. You see that? That's, if that's not explaining to us what's going on, I don't know what is. And the church should be able to say to him, well, let me explain. Let us celebrate with you your botany. In fact, let us get involved with you. And how can we help? How can we be a part of this? How can we help you save the plants in the Caribbean? There's a guy we know down in Mississippi named Baxter. He's close by. Maybe he can, you know, you get involved. Rather than because we cannot see it, we're trying to invent a kingdom that we can see and drag along other people in it. And that's why they get drained and bored and sad and burned out. We are actually getting them to walk away from the passion and life of the Trinity in them to invest themselves in a false kingdom. And when he raises his hand or a 12-year-old little boy in church raises his hand, what happens? We don't celebrate the question. We just shame it, move it over to the corner and keep building and keep trying to call this thing that we're creating the kingdom of God. That's where this gospel, this truth of all truths, sets us free because it shines in, it shows us who we are, and it shows us that we've been pretty blind. And it is embarrassing in a family embarrassment kind of way, not in shame. You know, I'm going to think, man, I spent a lot of my life afraid. I spent a lot of my life afraid. And when I see who I really am, and that I'm seated in Jesus, in the Father, in the Holy Spirit, above all rule and authority, in every name that is named, in all creation. Why am I afraid of anything? So it shines in. I see myself. I know now where my passion from a little boy to understanding the fight that has come from. It's come straight out of the heart of Jesus. I'm not saying I've expressed it perfectly at all. I'm just saying that's where it comes from. And that's what's going on in your life. That's what your life is about. And it's so beautiful and infinitely diverse, it can express itself in you in multiple ways at one time. So, I think that's enough for one night, don't you? You want to have a little process? You want to do Q&A? We're done. Let's have a prayer. Can we have a prayer? Now, let me read this, share this with you. Lord Jesus Christ, beloved and eternal Son of the Father, Hamusias Topatri, anointed of the Holy Spirit, incarnate, crucified, resurrected, and ascended Lord of all creation, I believe in you. With great joy, with the praise of my whole heart, I acknowledge and agree that you have found me in my darkness and sin. You have laid hold of me and taken me down in your death. You have freed me from sin and evil and quickened me with new life in your resurrection and lifted me up into your Father's arms in your ascension. All of me and mine, every war-torn fragment, every fearful, unbelieving, shame-riddled, broken part is in you, in your Father, in the Holy Spirit. I rest in you, Jesus, lover of my soul, my Savior, my salvation, my saving act, my King, my liberator, healer of my broken heart, the author and finisher of my faith. You have included me in all that you are and have in your union and face-to-face -face communion with your Father. And you have included me in your anointing in the Holy Spirit. And you have included me in your victory over evil and wickedness and in your session at the Father's right hand above all rule and authority in heaven and on earth. Nothing can separate me from you, your Father, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you, blessed brother, Lord Jesus. You became what I am to bring me to be what you are. I hear you speak my name, and with the freedom of your heart and mind, I turn towards your Father to see him with your own eyes, Jesus. I receive the witness of the spirit of adoption. 
I hear you, Lord Jesus, and your Abba Father inside my own soul. I receive your Father's everlasting love, and I give myself to you and all of me to your Father's embrace and to the healing and restoration of the Holy Spirit's communion. In your name, Jesus, amen. Thank you.